kick off this afternoon's program uh, with a very exciting um, panel and a really uh, important topic um, about gender in the city. Um, and so to host that, I'm going to introduce my dear friend, Asma, uh, who is a very special lady. Um, she is Moroccan, but uh, lived and studied in Paris. She is now based primarily in Berlin, but travels all over the world between Paris, Lebanon, Morocco, Egypt, everywhere you think you, she, she will go there. Um, Asma focuses on the links between gender and feminism and new models of working, of the economy, and creative communities. Um, she works for the Womanity Foundation, working on a media project. She is a We Share Connector, and she is the founder of Hypergender. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let her introduce this amazing set of speakers here today. Um, for the Q&A, like, the intent with the session is also to really make it participatory and hear your perspectives and your questions. So after our speakers give us some information, we will be passing over the mic to you. Then, Asma. Thank you. Can I, can I borrow your mic? Hello, everyone. Yeah, wow. Thanks a lot, Elena, for the beautiful description. Um, and uh, yeah, it's funny to have you all here, despite like the heat and how far away we are. Um, I, I'm super happy actually to, uh, to have around me dear friends and people that I met through my work, either through WeShare for Aurélie or through the Humanity Foundation for most of you. Um, and uh, the, the idea today is um, to discuss how um, how including and taking uh, gender into account in urban planning in the city in general is uh, crucial for making safer and more inclusive spaces. And um, I'm gonna briefly like introduce each of you because the idea was to bring um, a very different perspective on this topic from um, uh, institutional work with uh, Imad Karim who is working uh, with UN Women. He's the Global Youth Engagement Lead at He for She. Um, in a more also uh, broader, very dis different grassroots perspective, uh, a dear nomad friend, Aurélie Salver. Um, and Aurélie is uh, the founder of Shift Balance. It's a media platform sharing solutions to balance the world. And she's meeting um, grassroots activists uh, around the world working on feminism, gender, masculinity. She can tell you more about it and has been recently too. Pakistan and <laughs> Sri Lanka, and um, to uh, share with us solution more on on the ground as well, and how you actually have projects um, very people based. Uh, we have Audrey uh, and uh, Audrey Noltner. I hope I say it well. Audrey is urbanist and co-founder of Women Ability, an NGO to share solutions for more inclusive cities. And finally, we have Iman Bibars, and uh, Iman is the founder of uh, ADEW. AD -E um, it's an association for the development and enhancement for women. And um, Iman is also a regional director of Ashoka Arab World. I must say that Iman operates mainly in Cairo, and Ahmad is from Cairo, but also all around the world, uh, between New York and Egypt. And uh, Audrey is in France and also traveling a lot, so we're a bunch of nomads. And um, to dive a little bit more in the topic, uh, I would like to ask you actually, what make, made you, like what made you want to engage in this topic, um, and uh, what really uh, makes you a gender advocate today? Gentleman first or like Aurélie? <laughs> we like his story. He's got a good story. I heard it. Where, where were we? In Beirut? Yes. You have a good story. Yeah, Which yeah, one yeah. are you picking? <laughs> Come on, go for it. No pressure. Um, well, I'm the minority, so it's up to you. He's the token guy. We find him. We were like, okay, come to our panel. It's a victim. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's loud. Um, so I grew up with, an, with a saying that say, um, God created the village and man created cities. Uh, but also growing with the ideas that God and, and men are the owner of this world. So it's not a really friendly world for women. Um, so growing up in a village, um, I was born with my, when my mom was 11 years old. Yes, she was a child. I got married to one of her relatives and got out of school to take care of the family and all of this thing. Um, 
surprisingly, she survived and I survived the delivery and all of that. But then moving to the bigger city, the situation was not really that much different from the village where I grew up from. Um, in 2015, the Egyptian government have conducted a report about public harassment, the cost of the, uh, violence against women. And they found out that there's more than 2 million point five women have been public, uh, harassed in public transportation. You know, 2 million point five in 2015 only. Uh, but is it really just the Middle East that have this? Not really, yes. Um, there has been a lot of statistics in the US and in the UK about women feelings about um, their safety in public spaces. And more than 70% um, of the respondents of a lot of research have been saying we don't really feel safe in public transportation. 30% of them have kind of chose to change the way that they go from one station to the other because they don't really feel um, safe. Well, women, we don't really think about those kind of things. Um, what I was trying to say is that there is a lot of gender aspect in urbanization and development, and it has been working a lot from our bad design of cities because we men design the cities to work for us. Uh, without having to be concerned about the women who also now are the m more than 50% of the city population. So definitely gender have to be taken care of uh, or being the center of the design of the city, but zero, most of the times they don't have the chance to. So from my work in the public sector, we look into how we can make those policies to en engage women in the design of the city. But that's not gonna happen if women are not really getting into the design uh, schools, not getting the voice, uh, not being encouraged to study STEM fields from the very beginning. So it's a very hierarchy without, whatever we're gonna try to push from, you know, up down is not gonna work if it's not really, there's not that much working from grassroots up to uh, the same level. Me, I'm curious to know about uh, Audrey. Because she's been all around the world. So I'd like to know why. Why did you go there? All right, to answer the question, I'm going to ask you three questions. Uh, <laughs> so in Paris, um, what would you be, like, what would you say, what is the percentage of cities named after a woman in Paris? Like somebody says. Like 5%, 10%, 50%? Yeah, street names. <laughs> so it's actually yeah pretty low, 12 percent. And uh, since Hidalgo is here, we get, went up to 16 percent. So that's my first question. My second question is: In Paris, uh, if you see public equipment, what is the percentage of use by women in public equipment, like soccer uh, field, basketball court, skate park? What would say? How many women use these spaces? 20 percent. One percent. I think we're closer to that. This is between five and 10%, so this is a real problem. And my last question is, you, you already talked about street harassment or harassment in public transportation. According to a very uh, young st um, short studies, um, how many women have been harassed in public transportation in Paris? Uh, so you know the same number, 100%. So this is just my live life. Like I've never really thought about it, but I'm an urban planner and I was like, little by little working in the field, working at public hearings, I see only men participate. The city is not really mine and women go from a point A to a point B. And uh, one day I was biking to work and I got harassed on the bicycle and I was playing ping pong with my friends and I was like, hey, something's wrong. And my friend uh, Charlene was like, yeah, you're right, let's do something. And my friend Julian was across the table playing. He's like, what? What's wrong with women in cities? And so we talked about it and we decided to talk to uh, local NGOs and they all said, yes, there's a problem, but we don't really have solutions. So we say, okay, we quit our jobs and the three of us, so one man and two girls, or two women, uh, we decided to create women ability and Tra uh, travel the world to find solutions because how we learn in the beginning of the session, cities are the solution and we have to share solution because we all have the same problems in different contexts, but we all can share the solution because it's the same ecosystem. Yeah. 
So this is how Women Ability uh, was born. Thanks so a lot. She'll tell us about solutions. Yeah. No? <laughs> Curious to know. Um, I, um, I actually, I'm just going to jump uh, quickly on the topic of uh, harassment because uh, it's, it's funny what you say about Paris because I grew up in Morocco personally and for me I always took harassment in the street for granted and I uh, imagined that arriving in France I would be completely like in, you know, a very free and safe zone for women. Of course it's safer but uh, it's still very present and it's, uh, I, I have not uh, been not harassed uh, in, in a day living here. And so I wanted to ask you, Iman actually, the, uh, who, who grew up in, in Cairo, what can you tell us about um, you know, being a woman and uh, in a public space in Cairo, especially not in the city, but outside? Okay, um, I'd like to say that, um, uh, usually I don't like calling it sexual harassment. <laughs> I actually like calling it violence against women and control of the streets. Because sexual harassment then brings it to men versus women, to how you dress, how you don't dress, how you act, he's married, she's not married, and then we get into this crazy stuff of, you know, if you dress like this, nobody will harass you, which is nonsense. But I really like to call it violence against women, and do we own the street, are we treated as equal citizens, uh, having the same access to safe streets as men or not? Are we equal, or are we less, or are we something different? And I think this is the way I look at it. The interest I have really is not just urban like cities. I've worked in squatter areas for 30 years, but I also worked in all of the Arab world. I worked in Morocco, I worked in many countries in the region and in Africa. And with various ideas, the problem with lack of safety and lack of ownership of the street for women, the, the problem of not having a planner, regardless if they are the ones who plan it or not, but anybody to listen to women when they are planning, creates a huge, lots of problems for women in employment, in education, uh, in accessibility to opportunities, in training. It really affects their livelihoods completely. And I don't know if I will say it now or later, but I have examples of how this has affected women, uh, and not only from the revolution time or the Arab Spring, even before this, how this affected the lack of education for women or the lack of access to employment or even to progress. So I really would like to share with you this maybe later. But I just want to, share, to end with one, one story, uh, which everybody's repeating, but I really did it. I mean, it was my experience 25 years ago. I was five years old. Um, but when I was five years old, no, I'm joking, guys. I was not five years old, 25 years ago. Uh, yeah, they believed me. But yeah, I know they were too embarrassed to laugh. But anyway, um, but when I was asked, I just graduated, and I was asked to go and check on a project by American Aid in rural areas in Egypt. Upper Egypt is the south, and uh, everybody was upset because women, there was no water in these areas, and women had to carry water, and women had to, and men of course don't care, and they have to clean their things on the canal, and the canal is not clean. And everybody was like, the project was pro-women. They created taps in every corner according, uh, beside the houses of women. You know, so that she doesn't have to carry, she doesn't have to walk, you know, she's really suffering. And everybody thought every women should be happy. In six weeks, all the taps were broken, and we were very worried. Are these the fundamentalists? Do they hate women? Why do they want to break the taps? And so I went, and I lived there. And I'm a feminist, and an anthropologist, and it was the women who broke the taps. And when we asked them why, and it took me a long time, I stayed six weeks or seven weeks, when I, when, when, um, I, mean, uh, when I asked why, it was because the canal was their Facebook, if you now you're young, all of you, it was their club for us. It was where they go to socialize, to take a break from the man at home, to find husbands. How will the girl go and somebody will see her and like her if she doesn't have to walk until the canal so that the guy can see her? If she stays at home, the guy will never see her, or his mother will never see her, or the women will not know how to gossip. So, you know, and the solution was that we listened to the women for once in our lives, and, and we then created the taps on the canals. And then we can talk about the rest of the stuff. Thank you, it's a very inspiring story and actually uh, um, set, a, uh, set a light on uh, the importance of, of culture and taking into account culture of, um, of each city uh, that we are addressing. And I believe that Aurélie, you have quite a, a broad uh, research on the topic and uh, I wanted you to share a little bit more about um, how, um, how like the, the cultural background uh, of, of a city impacts your um, every like women, um, women's status in the public space and uh, in the urban planning as well? So, um, I don't know actually if it's that different. You know what I mean? It's like it has different ways, but at the end of the day, they are 
the different ways all say the same, which is women stay at home. Outside, the public space is not yours. You should be at home because that's where it's safe for you to be. And there are different ways to show this. It can be very violent with insults, with touching, with staring at you like it's weird that you're here and as if you were a zoo animal. Or it can be very soft, as you were saying, like gender budgeting, no? Just the fact that we only build stadiums for guys, no? We don't really care about what girls would like to do outside in the cities. So there are different ways, but the result is the same. To say, at the end of the day, the cities are male, they're done and designed by men for men, and the women are there, well, okay, because they have to go from point A to point B to do what they have to do to be a woman, but it's better that they go fast. And this, we, we, we do feel it, and it's very anecdotal. I mean, we think it's isolated. It's like, oh, no, but it's just what happened, or perhaps the way I was dressed, or whatever, I was in the city. But if you go to different places, and as you say, I go to different places, it's the same. So one initiative, for example, is to reoccupy the space. There's an initiative in Bombay called Why Loiter? And the idea is to say, because loiter is everything. Loitering meaning doing nothing. You know, all, I mean, I come from a very small village in France, and even in a small village in the Pyrenees, you have a bunch of guys waiting at the square pla place, right, of the city council or the post office, and, and they're just there. I don't know what they're doing, basically, but they're watching, talking with their friends, da da da. You rarely see women in any places of the world loitering just standing there and doing nothing and watching men pass and gossiping and whistling at them and saying, oh, you're cute, come over. <laughs> right? Why? So this initiative in Bombay called Why Loiter, that's what they do. I mean, they don't whistle at guys. I hope so. Uh, but they, they go to public spaces, even benches or near the, the, the sea in Bombay, they sit down and they take photos. And it, it seems stupid, but it's, it's very powerful. I, I go to public parks in Pakistan, they look at me as if I was, I don't know, a zebra. Like everybody is sitting around me because it's so weird, especially being a white woman, that you go to a public park. By so everybody, you mean men mostly? Um, even women, yeah. even women. Um, so, so there's this idea of um, reoccupying the space. And in Pakistan, girls at Dabas do the same with the chai place, so tea places. Because again, uh, there is an unspoken language that some places are just for men. So you're uncomfortable going there because you would feel you're the only woman. Everybody, no, there's no sign saying no woman, but you feel that you're not welcome. So there's a lot of initiatives that happens here as well in France, in Aubervilliers, for example, women, young women going into cafes and saying, this place is ours as well. So these are small initiatives that are very similar in Tunisia as well to say, how do we reoccupy the space? How do we stop? lowering the gaze. I'm, I'm really, I'm, I don't know what to find the world. No, I, uh, two things piss me off a lot. One, that I have to lower my gaze. That when I walk in a lot of cities in the world, what we say to women is lower your gaze so that you don't cross the gaze of another man that don't, doesn't trigger any words, any, anything. Why? Why do I have to lower my gaze? Why don't we teach our boys that we should not whistle to women in the street. We should not catcall them. We should not. I was with my dad yesterday in Toulouse, my dad, my own dad in Toulouse. He sees a girl, he passes, he's like, hey, bonsoir. And I'm like, dad, this is street harassment. And he's like, what? I learned a new thing. And he's like, yeah, because if 20 times a day men feel allowed to call you and say, hey, bonsoir, the first time it's okay, the second time it's okay, 20 times you're like, give me a break. So it's rethinking this because I, I think that men are not um, aware that as women, we ask ourselves, you know what we call the mental load? We ask ourselves many questions before going out, even during the day. What am I wearing? Is what I'm wearing decent enough? Is it okay to go in the metro like this? Will I have any problem? If I have a problem, what should I do? Etc. Etc. So we should not have this load. This is not okay. Why should we have this load? And why do we take it for granted?
And another thing that pisses me off, toilets. And that pisses me off, really. <laughs> toilets. Why do we queue so much? Where is the human-centered design in toilets? I mean, we do all these wonderful Stanford classes about human-centered design, I don't know what, design thinking. Nobody knows that women breastfeed, menstruate, have kids, have cumbersome clothes that we have to have because the gender roles tell us that we have to be neat and whatever. And we have the same number of toilets as men. So anywhere you go, airports, train stations, festivals, nightclubs, you queue. Well, no. We share first as well. We share first <laughs> as well. So again, nobody thought about this. It's not mean. It's just that nobody thought about, about it. So now we have to talk about it. And we have to talk about it in social media. We talk, uh, talk about it to our city representative, to people organizing airports, festival places, so that people are not, again, mean. They just don't think about it. I just want to say something about the lower the gaze. Because uh, in 2011, I had a, a Colombian friend, Luzette, if you remember, staying with me in, in Cairo. And I, we, I took her, I decided she wants to go with me to Tahrir, and I told her she will pretend to be deaf and mute, because she's a foreigner at the end, we didn't want problems. But anyway, and she looks like us, so she was not, but anyway. And then we went there, and she kept, everybody started talking to me in English a little bit, and I was surprised, I looked very Egyptian. Uh, the, the wind, either the, and then she told me, you, you don't act like the Egyptians. And I was like, why? And apparently, I was the only one who didn't lower my gaze. And I didn't notice. And the same thing happened to me when I went to Jerusalem. Everybody was talking to me in Hebrew, and I'm Egyptian. And I was like, why are they talking to me in Hebrew? I'm an Arab. And they said, you're the only one who didn't lower her gaze. So I mean, I think it's very interesting. And I think it, empowerment comes from your home also, and your confidence that we are equal citizens, and we are not less than anyone. But it's just that it's interesting, because I didn't notice I didn't lower my gaze. Um, it's very interesting, and thank you so much for like sharing all these challenges. And uh, or, yeah, and um, I, I maybe wanted to ask if uh, if any of you wants to react at some point, please feel free. I don't know if there is a mic turning or if we can have one, but just raise your hand. You're the mic, or do you want to react? <laughs> Hi, I wanted to react to the, what you were saying about the toilets and the way the space, um, like designers haven't thought about this, but I, I don't know, like there are many women designers and many women architects, so why haven't they also thought about it, you know? There are not ways for it. Huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you just maybe include in this, uh, there are some people, like some women talking about uh, non-gender toilets also, it's also a kind of a question, could you kind of say what you think about it and which, I'm not sure it's, yeah, gender neutral toilets, I, I don't know, maybe it's not always applicable, but maybe it's just in some cases, so could you just also react to that, when do you think it could be applicable? Um, hello, I'm a mother of a four-year-old uh, little girl and I wanted to know if you have example of in innovation or new ways of talking to little girls because you talked a lot about adults and in different parts of the world. And I think in Europe and particularly in Paris, it's also a start at home when we had the opportunity to be free women, but there are other many uh, new tendencies or trends for little girls that can also be uh, threatening their femininity or their... Yeah. Okay. And Hello, uh, thank you for the talk, very interesting. I wanted to have your opinion about something that happened in Bordeaux. Uh, they have decided to open a skateboard from uh, two to four, I, I can't remember, only for girls. And I wanted to know if you f you think it's a good solution. Thank you. I think we have one last question here and then the stage four. Just for sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 It's not really a question, it's a remark about the toilets. A male friend of mine who travels a lot and has young children took lots of pictures in airports of baby changing facilities only in women's bathrooms. Yeah. Let's go like question by question. 
Guys, Mike, please. <laughs> no one can hear you yeah. otherwise. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pass the mic. So you wanted to uh, answer the first question? Uh, sure. So why is there no women designer? Good question. <clears throat> it's, it's a very loaded question, though. Um, first, you have girls are usually, or like most of the average um, uh, grades of girls up until 13 years old, girls are way better than boys in mathematics, science, until 13 years old. Then teenaging, uh, um, adolescents start, and then uh, gender stereotypes starts, and then it falls up. Grades of boys doesn't go up, but like the, the grades of uh, uh, girls, especially in mathematics and science, with all of those kind of gender stereotypes that women should be studying, uh, humanitarian work, but not science because girls are more their mind doesn't work really well with mathematics. Uh, that's strange. Then that goes up up to all the whole field of STEM field, science, mathematics, technology. Uh, we only have from 12 to 20 percent of women getting into this field. Not because women doesn't want to, that's because this field is mainly uh, a male-dominated one. one. One example is the ICT sector. Up until the 60s, it was a women's sector. Only women was working in IT in the US, up until the 60s. Actually, the, the three women who created personal computer was women and no one really know their names because you know Maine came back after the war, uh, the World War II addressed it and then became slowly into the sectors and then bringing women back to their security. But it's not, it's not about that there's not really women designer, it's about who is responsible for the design of the city. One last example is the AC. How many of you have been sitting in an office and heard women complaining about how cold it is. Raise your hand if you do feel always cold in the office or you hear your female uh, colleagues complaining about it. A lot of you, right? Uh, in the 60s, when the US started having the regulations for the ACs, they tested or take the measurement of an average male to test the AC on, which is 165 pounds man to be in the office. And those became the standard of any centralized system. And since then, up until now, we still have those kind of things. So it's affecting the, the, the infrastructure of the whole city, okay. of everyone. Um, and the same for the toilet, the same for the technology, the same for our safety in the cars, that this doesn't work for women. Uh, if I may add that we can expand a little bit about not, not only public spaces, but also is thinking about how cities um, also affect women, not only from public space only, but also access to services, sanitation, health, uh, employment skills, uh, employment opportunities. But also thinking about not to only think about women as the only gender that we're talking about. We, sh we need also to think about why more than 90% uh, of those who are in prison are men. Why is a men problem uh, like homelessness is a male dominated problem? Why is there's for every four men committing suicide in the cities there's only one woman? Like we need to discuss like how cities are affecting all of our genders. Uh, yes, actually, and it was, uh, but I just wanted to like briefly answer the questions and then we can move like from uh, giving like sort of uh, feedbacks and solutions and examples, especially that, you kn that I mean, we all met through uh, working on masculinity in the Arab world, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's a way of addressing the challenge. But I'll do it briefly, but one of the things is it doesn't have to be a woman designer because as you said, who decides and who pays for it? I mean, usually money speaks. So even if you have 100 million women designers and their money, the one who wants to, to create the bathroom is, is a gendered approach or a, somebody, then it would be like this. But I also, I also have a problem with uh, segregation. I mean, in Egypt, when there was harassment, they decided to have a metro wagon for women. Then they want taxis for women. And, and for me, that's segregation. That's getting out of, out of the mainstream. To make us have two hours in the garden for women and two hours in the, we have now beaches for women because we, women want to wear veils and they don't want to wear bathing suits in front of men. And that's segregation. That's just putting us on the side. That, I, in my opinion, I'm really, really against it and I'm fighting it in Egypt and in actually in Lebanon, we're having a lot of discussions. Um, 
I don't want us to segregate and I don't want us to be on the side, really. If, I mean, again, for the young girl, and I'll just be very quick, if we're going to talk to young girls, I really think there's a problem with the younger generation. I'm an older generation than every most of the people here, and we were raised to understand that women have rights and they have obligations. We were told our history. Uh, we were aware of what's happening to us. I see younger girls now in the office, my younger uh, uh, colleagues, and their attitudes are very different because they didn't go through the fight, and some of them want to give up because the challenges are much more. So I think for our younger daughters, we really have to focus on giving them the history, to tell the stories, and she's the bigger one about stories, but we have to tell the stories. Let her grandmother tell the story, let go around and find out women who are strong in, in Paris or wherever you are, and let them tell the stories. I mean, we have a, girls, a program called Girls Dreams in our NGO, where we do a lot of things with the girls, but we also get older women to come in and tell their stories across the, the economic levels, although we talk with very poor women. Let girls be proud of being girls and let them know that it's not easy. And yes, we will take care of men, but let us focus on girls. I wanted to ask you as an urban planner, actually, to give so, us your yeah, opinion. So I think there's two kinds of segregation, uh, gender segregation. There's one that's long, like people, by some women don't want to swing with men. But I think the kind of segregation you're talking, I think this is positive discrimination kind of uh, for skating. We also went to uh, Malmö in Sweden and one of the skate park is only open on Monday night for girls because the owner of the skate park is a woman and she realized few little girls were coming to the skate park and she realized young girls were more intimidated to start skating because they didn't have friends or... In Sweden. Yeah, in so, Sweden. Yeah. So. So did she decided, okay, let's only open it for on Monday for girls, but that's just the beginning. So girls after can come on Mon Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So it's like this little push you give to uh, girls to start skating and feel less intimidated but and better. And so as after the Monday night will disappear, but sometimes but you, you need to be a little sure that the Monday disappears because it depends again, you talk in Sweden and Egypt or Syria or mm -hmm. Lebanon, I'm really very worried. And this is how segregation starts and with all the refugees coming to, but what I'm saying is be careful. I mean, whoever decides that this is a good way, let's do it because we're nice, because we want the girls to be empowered. It can turn against you in a second. Okay. But I'm just tell you. Yeah, yeah, it is different point of view, but I think the context is really uh, different in, I think it's going to be too, for the model for young girls, I think what's important too, is to, for young, can we? young little girls, to see other, to see other young little girls playing soccer, or seeing street names, or statue them after women, so when they walk the city, they feel the city is theirs too, because if you grew up in Paris and you only see street, like the subway of Paris has only two and a half uh, subway name after a woman, like uh, Barbès Rochechoir and Louise Michel and Pierre and Marie Curie. So when you grew up in Paris, you think all the important people are men or only Jeanne d'Arc who, you know, got uh, killed and <laughs> burned alive. Uh, so I think talking to girls, but also like having models in the streets. So when little girls and little boys grew up in the city, they don't see like male roles. Um, uh, yes, um, actually, thank you so much. Do you want to say a last word about uh, the questions? Uh, the we still have, yeah, the yeah. gender neutral toilet, I think, sort of have the yeah. address, but... Uh, gender neutral toilets, definitely. I agree with the question on, on men as well. I don't know if you saw Ashton Kutcher, uh, the actor as well, did a campaign on Twitter, because he was looking even in the US for uh, places to change his child. And I do believe in like social media as well, in taking pictures about this and tweeting and alerting the, the um, directions of these places. Um, about kids... Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's been said a, a lot. We, we we think we are free as women here. It's so wrong and it's so far from the reality. Um, it's difficult. I don't have kids, but I know that it's difficult to raise, would it be boys or girls, in a gender neutral way? Um, because they're conditioned so harshly by the media, by the school, by the colleagues, by grandparents, everybody, you know? So um, I really advise to work on, on the media side, especially to be very aware about, okay, bring them to see different types uh, of movies, different types of books. You know probably the book Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls that was a hit on Kickstarter, $1 million um, crowdfunded, just easy. Um, 
good night stories of 100 iconic women. So it's trying to change a little media and as well for the boys, so that the boys listen to hearing and stories about girls. Because us, as women, we listen to so many stories about men, but actually we don't listen to stories about women and men don't listen to stories about women. So there's a real balance, uh, an important balance on, on storytelling as well. Thank you so much. We actually have uh, 10 to 15 more minutes to wrap up. Um, so if you have more questions, um, yes. Thank you. So I'm studying architecture and I'm really interested in the subject. Like how actually can you change the way women can feel in the places? Is it by their shape? Is it by? Is it really the architecture of the place that's influencing, or is it the culture? I mean, the, the architecture influences the culture. We, we'll take more questions, but um, yeah, yeah. But that's what Iman was saying. Ask the women. We don't ask the women. It's like when we do work in NGOs and we don't ask the beneficiaries, no? It's the same thing. So basically we're designing, I mean, Vienna was a pioneer city in doing, um, in designing a city for women. And what they did was very simple. They just did a survey and they asked the citizens, okay, you're a man, you're a woman, what do you need? So they say, okay, me, for example, I wake up at 6 a.m. and then I go and bring my school, my kids to school and then after I pick up this, da, 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 da. And they could see the trajectories of women and the trajectories of men and their needs and the different needs. It's human-centered design, it's very basic, but it's gendered and gendered budgeting as well so that you know exactly, because this is our money, this is our taxes. That pisses me off as well that I know that out of my taxes, actually, so much is going for institutions and installations for men. What about girls? So it's and having being sure that in whatever thing that you're building, there's a gender budgeting. How much money is actually dedicated to something that will be used by women and by men? I feel your anger. <laughs> I would like to say. I would like to say that we design for functionality and we forget about the senses a lot. And I think the female qualities still are about the senses and we don't budget on sensing. We don't budget for high heels walking on the street, you know, I'm walking in my hometown. My heels are broken all the time by the stones on the street. Where do I budget that, you know? The fact that I don't want to run, you know, longer when there's a, a deviation. And, and go underneath a tunnel, get my hair all blown out by the wind and my, you know, wearing another shoe. Nobody thinks of that. And then when the people ask me, what do you need? It's about functional needs. It's about functional budgeting. It's not about what I really need. So even these surveys, they are probably biased. So this is a thing that you really should go into a revolution of sensing. All of us, I think, not only women, not only in this gender bias, but in general. It's underestimated. And I'm starting to um, into being interactive with the door design of toilets, by the way, because sometimes I get blah, blah, blah for men and blah, 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 possibly for women, I'm not sure. So I'm just going back to the bar and said, which toilet do you think I should take? I'm not sure. I think the men are talking more than me. And I, I want to be sure not to disturb one. Maybe he's standing there in a urinoir. I don't know. I don't want to disturb this guy. So how do I know which one to enter? I don't feel free this way. <laughs> and I started to do this a lot of times. So, so I just wanted to answer like a very concrete answer like for planning uh, and architecture. For example, in Paris, in the Canal Saint-Martin, there was like a street gym, you know, and it was 99.5 men because it was only like for the, um, the arms, you know, it was like only like this kind of street gym. And like they tear it down and now they rebuild it on the other side and half is for the, the arms and other half is for the ties, other half is the elliptical, like, uh, so it's more cardio. And now in a week time, you see like, so many women using it and they're like, oh, I'm waiting for my child to come out of school. But it was there for like five, ten years and no woman used it because there, it was no cardio. And now they built like the cardio equipment and now more women come. So it's really easy sometimes. And uh, Vienna does more hybrid space also, not close. You can use the same space for dancing, uh, for volleyball, badminton, not only basketball. So hybrid space and cardio. Can I be a party pooper? 
go. Thank you. Because I think it's very important, all these things. I just want to tell you when women are not listened to, because I don't care who plans. I just want people to listen. Uh, education. Girls do not go to school in many areas. I've done work in uh, Morocco. Tunisia, Syria, before the whatever is happening now, and uh, uh, Egypt, of course, and Lebanon. Um, and one of the real problems was that the schools were very far, and it was dangerous for girls to go, and it was dangerous for girls to uh, to to cross the the railroad. So fathers decided we will not send our girls to school, I mean, and therefore many girls didn't go. Some of the girls, I mean, numbers. Some of the girls didn't go to school because there wasn't any bathroom to start with, and they couldn't go to a co-ed bathroom in our countries. So there was no way except for one bathroom. So they just their parents didn't send. Another problem is unlit streets, streets that are alleys which has no light. When this happens, all the street vendors, I work with 350,000 females in, in um, seven countries in the Arab world, and I want to tell you that they stopped going. Their parents, their fathers, their husbands, some of them very poor, some of them social entrepreneurs, cannot go. They need to wake up before dawn, they need to come back at night, or they need to be nurses, or they need to go to school at night. They cannot go because some streets are not lit, so drug addicts do take, the, take over, and so of course it's, not, it's dangerous, or they are harassed, or, or or, or the loitering of guys, I like that idea, and they are unable. So their fathers, their husbands, their brothers, and they themselves don't go. Uh, some places where, for example, when we are planning, why don't we have police cars everywhere where you can, if you are harassed or you're raped or something happens, then you can find uh, access to the police or protection. When you don't plan that you have cars going into these areas, especially poor areas, especially the alleys, then girls cannot go. And again, they can't work, they can't go to school, they can't, I mean, so there are very, very, very serious, I mean, I think we have to have access everywhere, and I think it's important. But I also think that in many countries of this world, when people don't listen to women, to the needs of the women, when there is no lighting, when there is no protection, uh, when the local markets are all controlled by men for poor women, or when there are, you know, all these things are so important for their employment. They don't work, so they become dependent on men. They don't, they don't go to school, so they become then, you know, they marry very early, or they're not taken into consideration. Uh, all of these things affect their livelihoods, their self-worth, the respect of the community to, to them. So when we are serious and passionate about it, it's not just about us thinking, oh, we, are, we, we want to be men. Actually, we think we're better. I'm just joking again. But, but I think we need to have the same access to the same uh, uh, services, and we need to be treated as equal people and listened to. Nobody listens to women. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred designer who's a female, if the planner, if the people who have the police, if the people who have the light, or all the things I talked about have not listened to everybody. They can listen to men too, but they usually listen to men and they're usually men. So what happens is nobody listens to women and nobody listens to poor women and poor girls. Thank you. Thank you for it. Doesn't it work? Thank you. Uh, I wanted to share uh, an irony that you might, uh, you might have some interesting insights about. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who uh, had an executive job in New York. And I told her I was coming to WeFest. So I was trying to tell her about it. And I brought up the topic of Uber. And I began criticizing Uber for its kind of neo-feudal exploitation of drivers. And uh, of course, you know, the, the sexism within the company. And she was aware of all that. But for her, um, she, she was defending Uber. She really relied on it because it was a way for her to get a safe ride home um, from work because she didn't want to, she didn't feel safe standing on the street hailing a cab or, or taking public transit. So I don't know if you have anything interesting to say about it, but I, th I think it's a very negative thing also uh, Uber the Uberization because the commercial in Paris was like a little red Riding Hood behind the Uber driver and it's like oh the poor little girl the subway is so unsafe in Paris and you need to take Uber and so this is also like Uber is making money of creating the feeling of insecurity in like oh there's all those big wolf in Paris and so the little girls need to take the Uber and that commercial was pretty bad and it was in the subway and I was like how can the subway station or oh, putting this sub this uh, commercial on it. I think it's also good to promote transportation, safe transportation and safe biking. And yes, Uber is good, but I don't think women should be happy that Uber is there. It should be, everybody should be relying on Uber when they're drunk or tired, but not especially women. I don't think that's a good thing. But, but, but for me, I'm uh, I'm waiting for some messages in the in the metro, for example. You're talking about the metro, but uh, um, I, I do think that um, 
in many places, in Pakistan, for example, Uber and Karim have allowed women to go to places that they they couldn't go to because of the harassment that was massive in, in public transportation. So, so I know the dilemma there. Um, the the thing is, we have all these messages. No, now we with Vigi Pirat about okay, if you see an unattended uh, package, say something. Oh, mind the gap. If uh, somebody in Barcelona, everything about pickpockets. And yet, when you ask women in Paris, they say eight out of ten thinks that if something happens to them, nobody will help them. So I would like to have messages in the metro of Paris saying, if you see somebody harassing somebody else, say something. And don't lower your gaze again. We're all into this. It's important, the package that is left somewhere. But it's also important that we all feel safe to use the metro, and we all feel together that we support each other. So if you see somebody being harassed, say something. Intervene. Say, do you know this person? Are you friends? Make a joke, whatever you want. Say something. Maybe two. Um, thank you so much for sharing this and thank you for your questions. Unfortunately, I cannot take any more questions because we, we need to wrap up this panel because I have another workshop actually to explore um, experiencing gender in the city with embodiment there so you're welcome to join <laughs> um, but i wanted uh, as as a wrap-up because like we focused a lot on problems but at the end I, I heard some solutions so if each one of you as a conclusion could share just one um you know one main action or solution of a way to address any of the challenges that we mentioned so you said uh, more signs on the metro saying speak up to women uh, what would you say as an expert uh, working on mass community <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to defend men, uh, but I, I, would, I would say that we also need to understand men. Uh, we need to understand why is that happening. Why are men in the disease are depressed? What kind of pressure is that is also on them? What makes them harass women? What makes them great fathers or great models? Uh, what makes a lot of those, you know, the majority that doesn't harass women, why? Because if we do understand that, then we could have role models for those who are actually doing this on, on women. And also we need to understand how is cities are growing very fast and changing the, our culture in, in many different ways. How is that impact men? When we did the images research on, on masculinities in the Middle East, a lot of respondents for the question of why men harass women in the Middle East, says that they did it for fun. So that should be giving us cues about how we could solve the problem. Maybe the same as how Iceland kind of brought their use out of addiction to alcohol and drugs by building more uh, youth centers by engaging them by using all of their free time they could find ways of achieving those high standards of masculinity that we all grow up with there's a lot of expectation from men to be achievers to be you know higher in the ladder of the society and a lot of them they cannot really go there and some of them they don't want to go there they want to just live a happy life where they can be whatever they want to be uh, but this kind of masculinity affect severely women and other genders and in the society so thanks a lot uh, maybe to make it easier i would uh Iman ask you to okay i have two three three answers one <laughs> of it is we do something called uh, community mobilization where we empower the community to take responsibility for the safety of the community where we have something called street committees and the neighborhood committees and district committees and we address all these things through these committees um the, the second thing is I think we should encourage, and now working with people like you and women and bigger organizations, to listen, you know, and, and to listen to different people. The donors have a tendency, uh, so either they don't listen to anybody or they decide, oh, I will only listen to the woman who is poor. I think people should listen to all people. You know, you should go in and talk to NGOs, to people middle class, lower middle class, urban, rural, and listen to everybody uh, uh, and then find out. Uh, the last thing is, uh, oh, if you watch any Egyptian movie, the Egyptian movies constitute 80% of really the most famous movies in the Arab region. There is not one where the role model is not harassing women. 
not one. So I, I don't want to say that poor men are harassing women because they have the economic whatever. I think we have a terrible, terrible media the last 25 years or 20 years where there is not one movie where the guy does not harass a woman and it's seen as a funny thing. So storytelling is yeah, the second exactly. point. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I'm just going to quote uh, Jane Jacobs, a famer, famous urban planner sociologist, who say more eyes on the street. I think we just need more women on the street with uh, better equipment, uh, talking about senses, making sure the city is sense uh, enjoyable and it's fun because in feminists we need to put the fun in it, that cities are fun for women. And also just more women working on the street, police officers, bus drivers, people who are cleaning the street. I think that sends a very direct message if you see people, officers, passing fact, um, uh, people delivering uh, mails in China. It's only men, for example, that can deliver mail. I think we need just more women on the street. Thank you, Aurélie. Oh, I'm done, I've, I've talked a lot. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. I'm just gonna say as a conclusion, a brief, um, a uh, call for m nomination. My, uh, the foundation that I'm working with, the Humanity Foundation, is actually um, having a call for proposal to uh, mentor and uh, give grants to organization working on uh, creating safer spaces for, um, for women. Uh, and uh, yes, so p apply or come to me if you're interested because it's a, it's a very interesting uh, opportunity. And uh, thank you so much for being here. If you want to keep exploring this topic, I invite you to, to go back inside, but it's the places are limited, so, um, so yes. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Elena.